aware of some of the new laws that were passed in Sacramento that might have a major impact on how things will be done in the state? Stay tuned. We'll talk about some of those laws on Talking with Henrietta coming up next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Henrietta. California State Assembly member Mark Berman, who represents part of San Mateo County and Santa Clara County, wrote in one of his district newsletters that 2018 was an historic year in Sacramento. Since the California State Legislature passed major bills to protect the environment, voting rights, and voter information. It also passed one of the strongest campaign finance disclosure laws in the nation. On this show, we'll look at some of the major bills that were signed into law in 2018 and this year and how they might affect us. My guest is Regina Wolfson, who is the executive director of California Black Media. Ms. Wolfson works in Sacramento and has served in her current position since 2013. Prior to her current position, she served as a communications consultant with the California State Board of Education for three years. Well, welcome, Regina. Thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure having you. And thank you for having me. Of course. Now, talk about, let's start with California Black Media. What, what is the organization all about? Well, California Black Media is a nonprofit that my father, my mother, and several other um, publishers, uh, black media publishers, started um, back in 20, I mean, I think it was like 2002. And um, they started really essentially putting their eyes and focus at state government, state rules, regulations. And it was an advocacy organization um, that wasn't, I think they went through different iterations of, of what it kind of um, what it was going to do in terms of looking at their fair share of dollars that were coming throughout the state, making sure that um, these communities that they serve through their newspapers and media outlets um, were getting the information, were also getting the paid dollars that go with that information, um, and making sure that they were just better connected so that people could be engaged in their government, um, not just at a state level, but really being able to understand um, you know, what it means to them at a local level. And so, in 2013, I had the opportunity to take over the organization after my stint in government. I was appointee for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and stayed um, a little bit underneath Brown's administration. So I got to see government at its highest level so, um, in the So state. Before, before you keep on, you were saying that in 2013, you were an appointee of Governor Schwarzenegger's. Yes. Was so this what, for the California sorry. State Board of Education? For this, yes. So when I got appointed, I worked for the Secretary of Education, then went over to the State Board of Education and did some work um, while I was at the State Board of Education. And I, they, they had me moonlight two jobs at the time. Uh, that's whenever the state was going through um, the financial crisis. And... Um, we were going through that crisis, and so um, we, you know, people were going on furloughs, and so um, I was picked up to work on the census, and so I then led statewide um, outreach efforts um, in schools, faith-based community, as well as work with ethnic media. So it seems that you have a lot of experience when it comes to working in Sacramento, working in the governor's office, and working with legislators. You know, I, I have my fair share of experience. I wouldn't say I'm a pro, but I do, you know, I do know a, a fair share of people. Um, 
I am, you know, it, this government is so large that I don't know that you'll ever fully, full, you know, feel that you'll fully know everything. But um, I definitely, um, you know, I'm very familiar um, with how some things work in the in the capital, and and, and constantly learning. Um, so you know, I've been around this for a while, and that's why it was such a natural fit uh, when my father asked me to take over California Black Media. Um, he thought it would be a natural fit for me to take it over and be able to help um, California Black Media go into the next generation and the next level where we are, where we've been taking it now. Sure. Now, obviously, you would be a natural for it since it's within your family. And you've talked about the history. So what is the organization doing now? So the organization, um, when I took over in 2013, I really had to kind of figure out, I've never run a statewide organization, I've never run a nonprofit. Um, and so, you know, I really had to look at what was going on in the industry, understanding what was missing and what the gaps for opportunities were, and then really trying to find the niche of where California Black Media could help bridge the gap. And what we, what I recognize is that I don't care what city council meeting you go to, even, you know, um, county board office, um, local school board meetings, unless there's something really, really hot and juicy on the agenda, we people just don't show up. Um, but they don't realize that decisions are being made, and they're being made and until they are upset. The reason why they're upset is they show up because decisions were made, meetings were maybe even years before, and, um, and nobody was watching it. And so I've had an opportunity, like I said, to work on at some of the highest levels and watch how communication plays a role in in government, in engagement, and how people get informed. And I took that and said, you know, I think there's a there's a place for California black media. And so we've evolved and I think that we're gonna continue to evolve. Um, but we are, you know, we're an advocacy organization, so we go, we advocate. I think that one of the things that I'm really, really proud to say is that no matter where I go, people are like, we know who California Black Media is. There's so, there's so is, many it, people. is it primarily um, is it primarily a Sacramento-based organization? Oh no, we're statewide. So ah. while we're while we're based here in Sacramento, um, we work with media outlets that are African American owned throughout the state. So if your audience and you're an African American owned media outlet. Um, we pretty much are helping provide what we what we saw that there was a gap in information and people really understanding how some of this stuff works and it's complex. So we have developed a news bureau um, that is still forming, it is still growing. Um, we've gone through our growing pains of having good, you know, journalists and then not so good reporting. Right now, I believe we're on fire with. Um, the reporting that has been coming out. And what we do is we look at issues that will impact the African-American community. And it may, it, it may impact everyone. Sure. But we say, how does it impact the African-American community? Sure. Now, it's, it's interesting. You said that the organization is growing. Now, many media outlets throughout this country are suffering because of the Internet. So yeah. how is it that California black media happens to be growing and the news bureaus seem to be prospering? How is the organization funded? So the organization is funded because I have to go out and hustle. So that's, so that's the first thing. We get grants. Um, so it's a nonprofit. So we're, we're a nonprofit. And what we're doing is while, while the news and the Internet has shaken things up, um, the one thing that people still want is good quality information. Um, you know, good quality information is, um, there's no shortage of that. And being able to articulate how these um, policymakers are making decisions that will impact everyone else's life, um, you know, I think that, that there's no shortage of that. And right now, philanthropy is actually throwing a lot of money um, in news organizations. I'm not saying that we're getting any of it, but we have been we have we have been on the receiving end of some great grants that have allowed us to continue to do our work and thrive. And what we're doing is, I take every opportunity to jump on that and build on it. So when I say that the you know the industry and that what we're doing is growing, it's because. People want us to be able to articulate. People don't want a press release. People want us to be able to 
take a story and be able to tell people what does this mean. So, for instance, um, the you know um, school education um, numbers have just come out. And while we haven't really looked at it, we we have just um, started contracting with a new education reporter who's going to be excellent. Um, his first story, which we're hoping will be out next week or the week after, he's analyzing the data so that we can then look at this data and say, what does it mean to African-American families? Okay, so now, Regina, wide. Let, let's kind of save that one for just a little later as sure. we talk about uh, some of the legislation that comes out. And before we actually get to talking about the legislation, I just want to mention there was a conference that uh, ethnic media representatives went to in Sacramento. That was about yes. February, March. I think that was in March. February. 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 OK, and we have a photo of that. And if you could talk something about that conference, because I think you were very yeah. instrumental yeah, so in California facilitating like that. Every year. Every year, California Black Media has partnered with the California Newspaper Publishers Association, which is the mainstream dailies, big dailies. And I um, have partnered, brought in ethnic um, media services with Sandy Close, who you know, and um, Arturo Comona, who has also been working with the Latino community. And we're bringing all the ethnic media to the table. And that conference, um, we did sponsor, we helped sponsor. Um, the day where we talked about the census and the picture that you're referring to, um, I think that right after that we had I had arranged a meeting with um, some of the governor's top advisors to talk okay, about. Okay, now census. let let me interrupt you because you can't see that picture and you talked about bringing ethnic media to the table and this yeah. picture shows uh, some of us, myself included, sitting around the table and you mentioned oh, okay. Sandy Close and she's here in. Purple, yeah. purple jacket. You you can't see her, but I'm sure you're familiar with the yes. with with the particular picture. And yes. uh, there is this conference going on in terms of the census. So continue to talk about that because we later have a photo of many of the some of the ethnic media reporters after a conver a, a conversation, a discussion with the governor and his staff. And you did get into that. Yeah. So. That, that, that conference was really about bringing us together, talking about um, kind of the state's plan and rollout for the 2020 census and making sure that we were going to get ready. Obviously, at that time, there was a lot of controversy um, around um, um, the federal government's um, role and what was happening to scare residents from wanting to fill out the census. And so we thought it was really important to make sure that our communities were at the table early on during the transition of the governor and, and since we were, you know, handing this off to a new governor, um, but making sure that the investment um, that California made, California made a $187 million investment to ensure that we are able to, you know, make sure that residents know why the census is important, that the census is safe, and that they should fill it out so that, um, uh, so that we can get our fair share back of our resources that we send to the federal government for all those great programs that um, help so many communities thrive and help businesses decide where they're going to locate and, and where they're going to be. So we really, you know, use that conference as an opportunity to bring ethnic media to the table. Okay, early so we, we, we see some of the photo. I mean, we see some of the representatives in the photo. So talk about what communities are represented in ethnic media. I know there's India, um, there's Vandana Indian. Kumar from India Currents, and yes. you know of a, a few there's other Native ethnicities. Native Americans, we, we, we brought a Native American con um, a contingency together um, and had, I think, about 12 media outlets come into the governor's office. You guys, that was a different day. Um, they didn't come on that particular day, but Sandy helped organize that. Um, and um, we went directly you know, from the, the luncheon. Latino community. Um, you know, obviously, you know, many of the African American publications that are here throughout the state, uh, many of them all were represented, and the API community was represented. And so, um, we, you know, strive to make sure that we're inclusive. Sure, and that we can see we, the next photo. 
we can see the next photo. Oh, you can't? Okay. Um, we and the next photo, sure. I should tell you, since you can't, you're not here in the studio, the next photo shows you standing with some of the ethnic media reporters right after the conference oh, okay. with yeah, some of the right governor's, the, with yeah, some of the governor's staff. And it's a photo I miss out on because I, I tarry to ask a question of the of the governor's staff members. Oh yeah. So uh, you're here, and do you remember anything about that staff meeting? I just remembered. I mean, the governor's office really wanted to hear. You know, what were the concerns? They wanted to make sure that. Our voices were not left out. They understood we were trusted messengers, an important part of that conversation. And, and as I've said, as the governor has people in his office that do believe in um, ethnic media and our importance, the, the importance and the role that we play in educating the community. It seems that certainly the governor happens to be listening and some of the legislators tours are, mis, uh, are listening with some of the legislation that had been passed. And we can uh, go on, we can drop that particular picture and go on to talk about some of the actual legislation. For example, um, there is AB 392, Regina, the California yeah. Act to Save Lives. So yes. could you say something about that particular bill that was passed? Yeah, so AB 392 was a very, um, it was a contentious bill because law enforcement um, felt as though they were being attacked and you had vulnerable black and brown communities that also felt like they were being attacked. And so this was um, a, a courageous, you know, um, an ambitious legislation. Um, it ended up being where law enforcement dropped their, um, they dropped their concerns um, about the bill, um, but they, um, for sure, I mean, it was, it was, you know, it went through the year before. It didn't, it didn't go anywhere. It died, and then it came, you know, it came back kind of in a different form. And, you know, concessions had to be made to, to get them to a place of being able to have the governor sign it, but. Um, you know, I think one of the things that governor said was, you know, this is not the thing that's going to, um, for lack of better words, be the silver bullet to to stop um, um, the, you know, kind of unlawful acts that are, I don't want to even call them unlawful acts, but it's not going to possibly be the silver bullet, but it's something that we need to do as a start and, and have that start of that conversation of bringing these communities together. Um, and so I think that it, it was one of those days that was a really historic day. Sure. Now we, we eyes have of so many advocates that have been yes. fighting for reform. We have a photo from that. If we could use that photo, it's of the governor right after the signing of the bill. And yeah. uh, it's the next photo that's in line that we could see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. And so you might be, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the photo because it was... Uh, yeah, there was an article that appeared it. that we even used in the East Palo Alto Today neighbor, uh, newspaper where the governor is surrounded by supporters of the bill. Um, and the idea is that it would lessen some of the shootings of uh, young men in this country, especially young black men in this country. Yeah. So. That, that was that's the thought behind it and I and the attention and that's um, I want to say it was over a hundred year old law so they were looking at really trying to um, work to, to try to um, change that and um, and so they got to a place where this law will be in place and and you know the advocates felt like hey we didn't get everything we wanted but it was a start and they um, and they were okay with that and law enforcement backed off of their um, opposition to the particular law. In um, fact, what was, was very written. what was very interesting in it, it was that there was some support from the law enforcement community. Right. So there, it and, seems. And there, I think it was the DA. Um, I think it were certain DAs and certain communities were okay with it, 
but I don't know that it had wide support of sure. law enforcement. We can go to a two shot if we could, for the most part, stay on a two shot of uh, myself and Regina. So Regina, the next uh, bill that was very influential, that might have been also very controversial, was one related to charter schools. So yeah. could you talk about the bill relating to charter schools and why that was so yeah. important? So um, you're probably referring to 1505. Um, that particular bill just you know, charter schools had a very ambitious plan to, um, they wanted to start with putting a moratorium on charter schools, um, and the Charter Schools Association obviously was not, you know, excited about that at all. Um, this also was one of those bills where they had a, you know, it, the law hasn't really been tinkered with in the last 30 years, and so um, this, you know, this partic these particular changes help to, you know, helped everybody to kind of understand the rules of the road. It still allowed, there was compromises that had to be made with, you know, charter schools um, not being able to operate outside of their district. They couldn't appeal all the way to the state board. So there's certain things that change that process, but they still have due process because they'll be able to, um, if they get a, a no, um, um, a vote of no confidence or what have you, a, a rejection at a local district, they're still able to appeal to a um, county office of education. So there, there, there was some give and take. Um, there were lots of negotiations, my understanding. I wasn't involved in them, but I heard about the different negotiations and, and how it almost didn't happen. Um, but I am, I'm glad to see that... Um, that people are kind of being forced to have to have these conversations, even though they're difficult, and people have to do some give and take on both sides. Now, it's and it's very it's interesting, if I can uh, stop you for a moment. In the East Palo Alto community, the local community in which uh, I operate, and the East Palo Alto Today newspaper covers, uh, the charter schools are controversial because they pull away funding from the public right. schools. Right. And, and since the public schools are funded by right. the number of students who attend on a daily basis, the right. less students attend, the more public money, right. How much money? the right. school <laughs> system loses. So in right. that way, it weakens the public schools. So I find it was very interesting that these are bills that were passed into law that gave more power to charter schools. Well, they didn't really give more power to charter schools. What they did is, I mean, local districts are going to be able to look at, like one of the things that they said is, hey, everybody has to have a, you know, credential teacher. I want to tell you, good charter schools, what we should be doing is good charter schools our public schools should be learning from them. The reason California Black Media covered this area so heavily um, is because numbers that came out that looked at these these are no lie numbers. These are these are state numbers. Um, eighty six eighty I want to say eighty percent of African American students across the board, no matter what socioeconomic um, status they had, they weren't able to do math at grade level. 68% are able to read at grade level. That is, that is something that really becomes a state of an emergency. And for um, a organization like ours and businesses that we support and, 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 and are advocating for, they need, a, they need people who can read. So they you know, people, you know I, I do have some of those figures in front of me that in California, 68 percent of all African-American students are performing below their grade level in English, yeah. and about 80 percent right. are falling behind in terms of math proficiency. Right. And 71 percent of African-American high school seniors in California earned a diploma in 2017 compared to 93 percent of Asian students. And some of the statistics show that some of those uh, charter schools we're really making a difference in terms of uh, yeah. 
showing higher grade level marks for minority students, African American students. Yeah. I mean, and some are. The ones that are, I mean, the funny part for us, really, in terms of covering this, nobody kind of talks about it, is that when you talk about local control and you talk about school board members, the reality is they should be putting charters that are not meeting um, the, the mark. They're not meeting what their charter, what they were aimed to do. Those are charters that shouldn't be in business. They shouldn't be there educating kids or not educating kids. Um, but we have to do something um, as it relates to this, because you can't continue to have those type of numbers. So and if, yeah. if I can just interrupt to ask the crew, we do have a photo from one of the conferences on uh, education levels and charter schools. So if you could bring up that photo, that would be the next photo that then we could talk about uh, the conference itself. Yes, so we have a photo and you know something about that conference because you, California Black Media, wrote an article relating to mm -hmm. it. Do you remember it? Which, which conference was this? This was the one that took place. Tanu Henry wrote it about California charter schools bringing hard data. So we were talking about some of that data. Right, right, right yeah. So I believe that they were, I think they did a town hall. And so I think they did it. I think what you're probably referring to is a town hall they did with Roland Martin. And they were bringing yes. the data and the facts to the community. And I think it was eye opening for us um, as news organizations because it's data that you could not deny. So the question that we had to have is a difficult question for educators and people that are in the system what are you doing about it? Yes. And it can't be, well, we need more money. It has to be how are people who have less, um, who have those, you know, the schools that are typically raggedy and broke down, how is it that they are exceeding even with less? And so we, it's 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 a catch twenty two because there's you know there's people who will misquote information. They'll say charter schools aren't aren't public schools. Charter schools cherry pick. Um, what happens is charter people are looking for their kid a, a different option. And for the charter schools that may be open and designed to do certain things, the families are looking for it. And yes, that means that if families are not looking for that, are left in, you know, overwhelmingly, I guess, maybe left into the traditional public school, um, it means that, you know, schools have to say, wait a second, what am I, what do I have to do? Yes. What do I have to do to make, what do I have to do to make sure that this system is attractive other than saying I'm going to trap you in a school and not make sure that you're being educated. Well, it seems you bring up a very good point that perhaps uh, there is a lot from charter schools, the good charter schools that public schools could learn from. Now, there is also the, uh, the bill that would force those interested in running for office to reveal their taxes in order to be on the ballot. Are you familiar with that particular bill? So I am, and the very interesting part about that particular, um, the very interesting part about that bill is that um, I believe that the Supreme, I, I want to say, I think it was a rules unconstitutional. So I think we did it, and I just read an op-ed about it. We didn't write about it, um, but it was, um, Brown, I know, I, I believe it was brought up with Brown a couple of times. He vetoed it, um, and partially he vetoed it because it was kind of going after a political party, um, and it was, um, um, I guess they, they ended up deeming it unconstitutional and that the states didn't have the right to kind of put a um, recommendation like or a, a qualification. It wasn't the state's role to be able to do that. Well, so at least it actually got rejected. However, Governor, didn't Governor Newsom sign it into law he did, and the but Trump yeah, administration he did, and then it got recently? Rejected. Like, I, I, and I don't want to really speak. I mean, I have to go back and look this up, but I know that I just read a article. I believe it was in the L.A. Times, and George Skelton just wrote about it. And he did a column that kind of said, you know, anybody, like, like that California keeps, I think it was kind of like California keeps delivering um, 
Donald Trump the the um, uh, blessings or something like that. There was something to that effect. Yes, and, and what it was, uh, as I recall, that uh, it would be a way of forcing any candidate, new political candidate, to release his taxes before yeah. the, his his or her name could go on the ballot. Right, and but he, he got rejected. So that p particular piece, though, um, I think was, uh, uh, yeah. the Trump administration challenged it. It wasn't the Trump administration that challenged it. I'm actually working to pull it up right now. Um, but, yeah, so it was, um, you know, a federal judge ruled last week that Democrat legislators and Gavin Newsom had no business trying to strong arm Trump into publicly releasing his income tax returns as a condition to appear on the California presidential primary ballot. A U.S. Uh, District Judge Morrison uh, England, Jr. shredded the Democrats' rationale and the gotcha legislation, he ruled it unconstitutional on three counts. So we he won't issued a temporary injunction blocking, um, uh, injunction blocking the first in the nation law. So, so we won't be seeing that one. So yeah, so so basically we did it, and uh, you know, the legislature, the governor did it, and a judge came back and said it was unconstitutional. So. Um, yeah, it, yeah, so it's basically going to be invalid. So I, I wonder if the state could then appeal the judge's decision. Um, the article probably doesn't go that far. I don't know if it goes as far as saying that it can appeal, but they talked about um, Jerry Brown um, basically saying why he vetoed it. And um, the, the, the many times, I guess, that it came up underneath Jerry Brown, but he um, also refused to le release his own taxes when he was running for president in 1992. Oh, did he really? And for governor in 2010 and 2014. In all so of those years? he said it was a slippery slope, is what Governor he didn't Brown's read, veto he, message was. He didn't re release his own taxes. Yeah, Governor Bert Jerry Brown did not release his own taxes. So it would be consistent for him to veto the bill. <laughs> so it was consistent for him to do it, but he said what would be next, like one of the veto messages, what would be next? Brown asked in his veto message, five years of health records, a certified birth certificate, high school report card, and so... Um, well, those were some of the things Trump yeah. was asking of Obama, his birth certificate, his graduation right. records, so... <laughs> right, right. So it's ironic, but I think that what happened is, I mean, obviously Trump was just saying it as a citizen, but... Um, when you're trying to put it into law, um, I think that that's where, you know, they kind of said this is a slippery slope and, you know, Governor Brown didn't do it, um, so he said no, and, um, and basically, you know, you have a, a judge who's basically said it's unconstitutional. Well, we'll have to see where that goes. Now, there yeah. is one, as newspaper people, that affects newspapers, and that was AB 170. And yeah. can you talk about that? Yeah, so AB 170 um, really came about around AB 5. AB 5 was the law that um, was really codifying a um, Supreme Court decision, a, a California Supreme Court decision called Dynamex. And that law was basically a trucking company who um, misclassified its workers, had its workers um, at one uh. point, and then turned around and turned them into independent contractors, but didn't change anything. They basically had to wear a uniform, and they were still told when to do whatever it was that they were doing. They didn't meet the test of being an independent contractor. And so that set in motion a entire frenzy um, once that decision was you know, once that decision happened, it created, okay, now we can go after Uber and Lyft, we can go after the gig economy, and really kind of upend the, you know, workers that in some cases could be probably misclassified, but in other cases, um, you know, how, how you had to redefine that, that classification. And so um, that was a very, um, that was a very um, intense, um, uh, bill that made its way through the legislature, now, and you probably didn't saw that, the protests. Didn't that end up saying that newspaper deliverers were not independent contractors? Right. So, and so independent what, so newspaper what, deliverers, in many cases, are are in fact independent contractors. Well. 
I think it depends on how you classify them. I will say ethnic media, I believe, I mean, I made a plea. So AB5, all of that, you know, you had AB5 and you had a lot of businesses that if they were early on and had great lobbyists, they were getting carve-outs. So nurses, uh, not nurses, I'm sorry, doctors had carve-outs. Um, insurance agents got carve-outs. So when you, got when, outs. When you, they is they that, get to do their business model the way that they've been doing their business model. Now, so when you say got, that word you're ahead. using, is it carved out or carded out? Carve, carve. C-A-R-V-E, carved out, yes. which means yes. that what they, they wouldn't apply, the law wouldn't apply to them, they would be independent contractors? Yes. Uh-huh. So the law won't apply to them. They were able to be carved out. So everybody, you know, was clamoring for carve-outs. Um, Uber and Lyft were clamoring for carve-outs because they said our business model, these folks are not employees. And so the legislature you know, didn't agree with that, I guess, and, you know, they could, they didn't get a carve-out. So now there's a $90 million ballot initiative looming to see what it is that they, they, they may or may not do um, because come January 1, people are either going to have to be employees or they're going to be laying off a whole bunch of people or, or, or basically disabling an app for a lot of different industries and a and, lot of different people. And that applies to Uber and Lyft now? That will now apply to Uber and Lyft. And so... To give you background, a little bit more background, um, AB5, there were different people who got carved out. Well, in the 11th hour, when we realized that there were things that were going to affect the news industry between, you know, even how many journalists. Right now, we have a carve out of 35 freelancers. So California Black Media uses freelance journalists. Um, I can only use that person. They can only submit to me 35 times before I would have to turn them into an employee. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Never so mind. That is, that's never. Journalist, never mind. Ju wait. Never mind that they might be freelancing and they're also working out of their own house. Right. Never. Doesn't, that doesn't matter. <laughs> so there's that carve out. Um, and and I think too the law. I mean, we're trying to figure out what it's going to mean come January so that we're in compliance, obviously. Um, but not just that photographers too so they can do 35 submissions before they need to before I would have to turn them into an employee so that's going to create a very different dynamic um, for us we're still trying to work through what that's going to look like in this space and in this environment but when they got to the newspaper carriers now it, Regina I ha wrote the op -ed. Regina before you go further I have a question for you mm -hmm. does it matter whether the photographer or the reporter makes 35 submissions uh, consecutively? Suppose it was three months apart. I just, the, I, it just says 35 submissions. So I don't know if they were being vague. I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest with you, we are going to have to work with, um, I mean, there's a whole collective group of people who have been working to look at this, and we're hoping to, you know, piggyback on understanding from, you know, other lawyers that can help us look at the law to say what it is, you know, how we're going to keep track of it and how, you know, how and if we are able to treat them, you know, if we have to turn them into employees or uh, if that, we have that to count will... that you get to 35 and once you're at 35, I can't do business with you or I don't know. Or you have a constant pool of freelancers. I, I'm thinking if yeah, you could use each person oh, I don't know, more infrequently uh, and use, you know, have a bigger pool of people. But even, well, it doesn't make sense if, well, I was going to say if they're not working directly in your office and they might be writing infrequently uh, once every six months or so, it's hard to classify them as employees. Right. So, I mean, I imagine that, but I think that, you know, we're going to have to look at the law and just try to figure out how, with the best legal counsel, what, what that really is going to mean for us. Sure. And so now you're lobbying legislators. Well, we're not lobbying legislators. I mean, what we've done, because obviously we're a nonprofit, so we don't lobby, but ah, we yes. do try to talk about the effects that... Um, 
this will have on even our nonprofit. There were nonprofits that were crying out saying, we're a nonprofit, and as you know how nonprofits are, you you don't you, you don't have stable funding all the time. Sure, that's so true. So it's crazy to try to say you have to you know have payroll taxes and not be able to you know there was just no wiggle room for that. Even nonprofits, nonprofits are you know if you said oh I have um, somebody who comes in and does certain stuff for us, they they may not be um, covered by that. You you may depending on you know. The rest of the test, you know, if, if they're free to work whenever they want to, like you have to really look at everything um, that would make them free of being able to um, take on other clients and not be under your control and, and really do a test on if they feel like you're treating them like an employer. If they're so really I, I'd, like to, I'd like to get a distinction from you because you said as a nonprofit, you mm -hmm. can't lobby. But right. then you can advocate, right? So what's you the can difference? Advocate, right. What's what's the so, difference? Yeah, so so the difference of advocating is not going in and saying, Hey, we want you to sign this bill, we want you to do this, going and actually talking to legislators. Um, what you know I did recently is normally I will never I would never really take a side, obviously just from being in journalism. I try to look at both sides and we try to make sure we're producing balanced journalism. But when I knew that it was going to hurt the industry, that's when I used my voice. And I didn't even call any legislators. They read about it because so many people were writing about it or, or publishing the article. So when, when all of our media partners started publishing the um, editorial that um, I wrote, it really spoke to what was going on in the industry, and not just the African American industry, but the Latino industry, and and anybody who was printing a weekly publication and had to worry about distribution, and and this is how they get their livelihood. Um, I think it would be most newspapers, a lot of yeah. newspapers throughout this country, uh, yeah. and in California, in Palo Alto, for instance. Yeah. Some major so newspapers. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that I want to make sure we're always treating fairly the worker because I truly believe that. My, my, my father is a son of a sharecropper. Um, I truly believe that we must take care of the people who are taking care of us. I believe that in the village, and I think I've, I've, I model that in our own organization. But I also know what our limitations are. So I'm working with people in many cases that are like, I believe in this so much, Regina, I want to do this until we get everything going the way it needs to go, or I want to do this because I'm retired and I want to give back more time, but I need, you know, I need extra income. So I deal with a lot of different people, and I think that, you know, yes, if somebody is abusing a worker, then we need to step up and make sure that that's not happening. But, um, but to destroy industries by policy changes, I think we have to really look at that. And I, and I will say I applaud the legislature. Even though it was only a one-year reprieve, it gives us time to figure this out. It gives and time it, to regroup, I guess, gives yes. time to work with other, to establish mm -hmm. collaborations. Yes. To, to, to bring some changes. Now, talking about supporting people's rights and advocacy, what about AB 142, the bill that tackles the housing affordability crisis? Yes. Um, I'm not as familiar with that one, but I know that we did do a little bit of, um, we did write about it a little bit. I know that it puts a rent cap. Um, I want to say that it um, puts, I think it puts some dollars, I don't know if this particular bill, because there was a whole package of bills, and $2 billion was put forth. Um, housing is complex in California. Um, yes, it is very it complex. It is really complex because you have people, you have a lot of different agendas. You have people who are like, we don't want people in cars, but you have people who are like, I want to still be in my car. You have people who are like, I don't want to live on top of each other, but then you have people who are like, no, we need to move everybody close to transit, and everybody needs to huddle, and everybody needs to live together. And I think that, you know, I think it's complicated. Um, 
it's complicated because I've, I've lived in inland areas, so I've lived in places where I needed my car. But today I got the chance to drive to, I mean, I didn't even have to drive. I had to go to Oakland, and I got to take the Amtrak, and it was so beautiful to take Amtrak and then, unfortunately, or fortunately, take Uber to where I had to go um, and then still get back home before my kids were out of school. Um, that was, like, beautiful because if I would have driven, that would have never been the case going from Sacramento to Oakland. So... Um, I do appreciate, you know, um, having the public transit, but I also understand some of the other realities. Um, you know, living in the Bay Area, if you had to live in the Bay Area, you'd have to make a lot of money right now to just to be able to probably survive. So, yes, not, 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 not only in terms of transportation and commuting, but also getting back to housing. Yeah. Uh, with, with apartments going up, the price yeah. of, of renting going up, like one bedroom, several thousand dollars, uh, yeah. having a rent cap would be something that a lot of people would appreciate, although landlords would not appreciate. Right. Like, you know, what's hard for me is that um, I do believe and I do think that, you know, obviously, I think anybody who's probably become wealthy in America has probably used, you know, property to do it. I don't think that you have to be... Um, I don't think you have to be greedy to do it. Um, I think that many people, and I, I wasn't really involved with all of the, I mean, I knew the folks who were like, the rent can't keep going up. But I also know that um, there are certain things that we would be tinkering with, whether it's saying, I believe Holly Mitchell had a bill, for instance, that, um, and I believe the governor just signed it uh, earlier this week um, about, you know, kind of making it so that you could not deny Section 8 housing to people. Ah. Um, but the reality is, is, I guess you couldn't advertise it. You would not accept it. Sure. So a person could come to you, and they still don't have to accept it. The problem is, in my understanding, and this was very brief, was really that homeowners are saying, I'm not going to have government come in and tell me what to do with my house, and they won't pay me on time, they won't pay me my fair market value. If something goes wrong, they won't cover it. So I, don't, I, I think that that's kind of a slippery slope, telling someone who, you know, has all the responsibilities, um, but then the government's not doing it. Well, there is sure something, the Regina, there is something called rent gouging. And when right, you increase the rent 100%, without yeah. any increase in services, well, then that seems to be out of balance someplace along the line. And it's now gotten yeah. to a point where even uh, Zuckerberg is saying that Facebook has to expand into other areas because being in this area, Silicon Valley, is presenting a problem even for Facebook employees to get housing. Right. Well, I mean, the reality is, is that he can do that, and, and we think about that, right? There's so many jobs that are centered in certain areas. Well, nobody's going to go to the Central Valley, but even if you do, you're going to start displacing people that have never owned, right, because it's supply and demand. And so my point of saying all of that is I hate, I don't want to hurt people for saying, hey, if you tell me I have to, if I have to accept Section 8 and I raise the rent even more, then you then you essentially not necessarily help. So what I'm saying is is that people have to government has to talk to the owners of properties. They have we have to work out a fair solution so that they could take someone with Section 8 housing or whatever it is to get us back in line uh, and and back in in play. But we also have to figure out how we're going to create better jobs and better paying jobs for people. You can't do that with 86 percent. African Americans not being able to do math at grade level, 60 or 60, 80 percent not doing it at grade level, 68 percent not being able to read, and think that we're going to somehow produce all these kids that now are going to get high paying jobs to be able to afford the rent, right? Like that's not, or be able to buy. So we have to really, I mean, our system is fundamentally flawed because we're not, we're trying to fix one problem. I kind of look at it as a, um, I kind of I've made this analogy before where I look at it like it's a, um, a Rubik's cube. You know how you're trying to get the colors all to match up, and we almost need someone who knows how to fix the Rubik's cube because as soon as you turn one thing, you mess up the color on the other side. Yes, right? absolutely and, and so right. We have to figure we have to figure out how we're not doing that 
to get to the place where you're getting all the colors on the right side. Well, it can be done. At least it has been done with the Rubik's Cube, and it has. there's so some I'm formulas that, that, that tell people how to do it. <laughs> now, um, I want to mention before we go the idea that one candidate has of a guaranteed income, but before going there, are you familiar with Senate Bill 206, the Fair Pay to Play Act? Yes, this is the, I think we did a headline on that, that um, it was, oh, it, I think it was a play on Show Me the Money. Black athletes now say Show Me the Money. Is that the one you're referring yes, to? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So if you can, can you walk us through some of that? So, um, you know, what I know about it is that um, the, you know, this bill has been around for a while. We actually didn't get to do all of the homework to try to figure out how, just how long this bill has been floating around um, the state legislature, but there were tweaks to it. And in this particular bill, um, I believe the, the um, I think the part that kind of made it so that things would go is that students were being student athletes. Ah, uh, yes. able to, you know, student athletes yes. are helping, um, helping universities and the like make money. And people are making lots and lots of money. And, um, and then the student athletes, yes, they're getting a scholarship through the school. Um, one of the things that I don't think it addressed um, was what happens whenever a, a, a athlete gets hurt. Exactly. And then they just kind of throw them out the school. So this could give them what they need maybe in some ways to be able to um, equal, you know, level the playing field. I get that it's going to, there's getting ready to be lots of problems because the NCAA is just not happy with this at all. Um, they say that it just, it really crosses the line. And I think this was just one of those other big bills that says, well, we're going to change this. And yes. California wanted to lead on this. Um, I think it was one of those things where it was just like the right time, right people were in place. Um, Senator um, Stephen Bradford out of Los Angeles um, co-authored the bill, and he's the vice um, chairman of the Legislative Black Caucus, along with um, Senator Nancy Skinner. Um, and they were like, hey, we're, we're going to look at this so that, you know, people who are using their likeness, um, yes. them dancing or what have you, that they should be able to be compensated from it. And so, I mean, that one is a to be continued. I don't know what's going to happen, but it is a to be continued to see what, you know, sometimes you just don't even know what some of these bills are going to do until you um, get into them. So, Well, it certainly seems fair for the student athletes. I mean, if they're making hundreds of millions of dollars okay. for the universities, and they're not yeah. able to capitalize, and the universities are using their likenesses, uh, right. and they're not able to capitalize or get any money from it jerseys, whatsoever. All that kind of stuff. And they can't get money from any of the athleticism that they're involved in. Something right. seems to be wrong. <laughs> right. And so that's how people have looked at it. And so people have, have said it's almost like a plantation where you're, you're, yes. you're taking advantage of these people. Um, and these students, and, and students that are, you know, one of the other things that I looked at is that in the black community, we have to think about, once again, with the graduation rates, with the, you know, with the education attainment in, in, in math and in English, um, we have to think about the fact that we have so many kids that that's their ticket out of poverty. That's their family's ticket out of poverty. That or the music industry, so we're overrepresented in those areas, and we have to figure out how we're going to fix that. That and people don't see that as their their way out. Um, it's been a way out for people, but we have to get our our communities to see that, so that it doesn't have to be that. That you can be an engineer, that you can be a doctor. I guess maybe possibly a plastic surgeon. I know some general doctors are probably like, we're not making enough money. Um, but that they can go into these professions and make, you know, to, 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 to stop the cycle of poverty. One last word in terms of the Fair Play, Pay to Play Act, that the athletes, when they're at universities, are primarily putting most of their time in terms of their sports and very little unfortunately, in the academics. 
And then when they're hurt, uh, they lose the scholarship money. And then what, have, what, what do they have from, right. from the service that they've provided to the college or the educational institution? Right. I mean, I think that's one of those things that we see. I think that's part of, I think I'm sure that that's part of the package and, and problem of why and why people have looked at this and said, hey, we don't have sympathy for NCAA. Um, we understand what you're saying, not making these people be paid, um, how they would possibly disqualify California schools. But, you know, um, we're, we're going to see. I mean, it, it, this bill is a to be continued. Um, I'd love to come back and talk to you about yes, it. Yes, we can one of our, now. You know, our, our now. reporters talk about it because I sure. do have them following it closely. Of what, in, you know, in what's the going closing, to be the next development? Regina, in the closing minute or two that we have, is there something that we haven't talked about? A new bill that you could summarize very, very quickly, or is something that you consider I, important? Yeah, I would say that as um, this evening, whenever I got home, I saw that the governor actually. Um, signed another bill um, that, you know, I think is going to be near and dear to anybody who has possibly been gouged with predatory lending. And um, it basically was, a, it's Bill AB 50, 539, um, Assemblymember Monique, Monique Lemon out of Santa Barbara. And basically it is stopping the cycle of payday lending, being able to um, up prices on people so that they can charge them, you know, up to 200%. Oh, in loans, terms of cases. interest rates. So you'll see that story um, next week. We should have that story, and, and we'll be sending that story your way. Um, so that puts a cap on, on the interest rates for predatory lending. Yes, yes. We, we have documents that you'll see that we'll be sending to you that, you know, for publishing where people were took out like a $5,000 loan and they ended up paying back $35,000 or $40,000. Oh it's, my gosh. It's actually sickening. It's sickening, but it's real. They're real documents. Well, I do know there are people in that industry who say that those who are, the people in the industry have a right to make a living. <laughs> and, you know, they, I guess. and they do, but <laughs> that, at that rate, at that rate, it's, it, is, it is predatory because People don't realize that they'll come in, like let's say you come in, there would already been a cap at 2500 but what would happen is they would tell you, oh, but Henrietta, you qualify for 3000 because they could charge you more on that 3000 So they could charge you up to 200 300% on, on that extra 500 because they're limited at what they could do at 2500 so, Well, Regina, thank you so much for so bringing welcome. all of this to our attention and just summarizing some major bills that have been passed. Uh, thank you so much for the sharing, for being You're so with welcome. us. And I'd certainly like to thank our viewers for watching. Until yes. next time. Thank you, Regina. Thank you. <laughs>